That wasn't on the sound team. That was on me. So I'll own that. Good morning. How are we doing this morning? There we go. I want to welcome everybody who's watching online. I especially want to give a shout out to our Middletown campus. Hey, Middletown. We are glad that you are with us. We've got a couple quick announcements, and then we're going to jump into the message this morning, which I am very excited about. I don't know if you ever played baseball, but you ever have a pitcher and, and uh, they put a little extra on it? Like they, they, they put some heat on it. I'm believing that God's going to put some heat on this message. Anybody with me this morning? Let's go. So um, on the 20th of August, I need everybody to get their, their smartphone out, get your calendar app. The only way you get a pass on this one is if you have a flip phone, and if you do, there's something to write on in the seat back in front of you. So write this down, August 20th, a friend and mentor of mine, Dr. Mark Rutland, is going to be here speaking, and you do not want to miss it. Dr. Rutland has been the president of uh, two Christian colleges, and he's known for leadership turnarounds. Anybody need a turnaround in their life? Anybody uh, ready to see God do something uh, exceptional in their life? So I want you to be here and I want you to be a part of it. It's going to be a phenomenal message and we can't wait to have Dr. Mark Rutland in the house. So um, we are in our final installment of our series called Frequency. And really what we're talking about is hearing the frequency of God's voice, hearing from heaven hearing God whisper, hearing God talk to his kids. And so we've been in this series, and we're going to wrap it up. And last week we talked about hindrances to hearing, things that can get in the way and things that that we can do that could keep us from hearing the voice of God. But this week we're going to talk about how to hear. Like, I want to give you the practical, that this is how you do it, like, the, the YouTube tutorial version of how you hear God. So uh, the title of our message is How to Hear, and I want to give you some practical ways. And uh, we've got a 10-point sermon. Uh, anybody nervous yet? Anybody? 10-point sermon. So I believe that the Lord's going to be with me, and we're going to deliver this thing, and uh, it, it's going to speak to you and minister to you, and that God's going to be in it. So As we look at Scripture, one of the things that we see is that God talks to his people in some super unorthodox ways. Like, he talked to Moses in a burning bush. The bush is on fire, but it's not burning up. It's not consumed. And then a voice comes out of that bush that you're standing on holy ground. So he talks to Moses out of a burning bush. He he talks to Balaam from the mouth of his donkey, right? Right? So like, talk about something that sounds crazy and ridiculous and unorthodox. There's one. Here's another one. In the New Testament, Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 2 talks about how there have been some who have entertained angels and been completely unaware of it. Like they, they literally had an encounter with an angel and they weren't able to realize it until after the fact. Just another unorthodox way that God communicates to his children. And just like there are so many ways that we can communicate nowadays, like just think of all the ways we can communicate through our phones and through social media and and, and through all of these different venues and avenues. Like there's, there's all kinds of apps like, Group me or WhatsApp or Messenger. Like you can you can text, you can do voice memos. If 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 the if you really want to get the text right and you want to communicate the right thing, then 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 you do a voice memo. And and how many of you are emailers? You rely on email and and you're just a big emailer. If you are, God bless you. God bless you. I usually stay about 30 behind. So uh, just just pray for me. Uh, Social media, you have all of these forms of social media and every one of them provides a way to communicate to others. And, and, And that could look like sliding into somebody's DMs. I mean, there's all of these means and methods 
to communicating. But just like there's the natural, there's also a spiritual component. And God will teach us through natural things to bring about spiritual truths, right? And just like there's so many ways to communicate in the natural, God wants to show us that he wants to communicate with us spiritually. So today I figured I would bring some just examples of of how um, uh, uh, we communicate with one another. Uh, Anybody remember this? Anybody having PTSD from a coach that you can remember back in the day who would use one of these? Oh, here's a good one. Here's a good one. Uh Anybody? Anybody? Rotary phone. Like the young ones just don't know Middletown. Like when you gotta when you gotta do this and this and and this and like have we called them yet? Hey Siri, you know, call mom. Nope. This is how you had to do it back in the day. I still remember my great grandmother. I'm pretty sure it was the Sherwin Williams cover color of uh, split pea soup green had one of these hanging on the wall. Man, I mean, we've, we've gone a long way. There, there was a pager. Anybody remember the pager? So you were either a doctor or a street pharmacist to have one of these, right? So a, a pager, a pager. Uh, walkie-talkie, niner, niner. Um, uh, original cell phone. Come on, somebody. I I thought I was so fancy back in the day when I had this like Nokia brick phone and I had this massive 300 minute uh, program that I was paying a fortune for. And because I was in love with my future wife, I used those 300 minutes up in about the first three days. And and the overages got me. I'm just I'm just telling you. And uh, so remember, you had to like pull up the antenna and the thing weighed a couple pounds. So uh, here's another one. Let's see. We got the flip phone. Got the flip phone. Remember when you could actually take a, like they first came out with a camera on these things and you could take a picture and it was real pixely and we've come so far. Uh, Blackberry? Blackberry? You want to send a text and, you, you know, it, it speeds up the text process. You could actually have email on this thing. Game changer. And uh, maybe, just maybe you played this is a kid, Landon, I need, I need your help. I need your help. And you could talk into it, and uh, they could hear something on the other end, and this thing. <laughs> oh, yeah, you got to pull it tight, pull it tight. And it, it kind of smells like uh, chicken noodle soup. But anyways, yeah, this was something we do as kids. I'll take that back. Thank you, son. And so there's just all of these means that we've had and we've developed over the years, and, and then we've, we've got, you know, we've got one of these, and uh, anybody remember a phone booth? Hello, governor. You step in this thing and all of a sudden a British voice comes out. But we have all of these means of communication naturally. The truth is in Scripture, God has so many means to talk to us also. Sometimes we can limit it and think God only speaks in a booming voice and he only did that for some people way back in the day in scripture, but I don't want God to speak to me today because it's gonna be loud and it's gonna be scary. That's, that could happen, but if you think that's the only way that God speaks, you're confused on the matter. So what I wanna do today is I wanna give you 10 points, 10 ways, and this is not an exhaustive list. We just want to get out of here on time and, and you know, and, and get to your restaurant of choice. There, you, can't even, you can't even begin to think of all the ways that God can communicate to his kids. So point number one is this, his word, his word. He talks to us through his word, right? His word. The Bible is the best place to start hearing the voice of God Because the whole thing is his voice and is his word and is his will. Now there's two Greek words. Remember the New Testament is written primarily in Greek, the Greek language. And there's two Greek words that define the Bible or define scripture. The first one is the Greek word logos. 
And it means communication, explanation, to talk. It means a statement. It means instruction. It means divine revelation. It's the entirety of your Bible from Genesis to Revelation. The whole thing is revelatory. It is all God's word from beginning to end. Now, that said, the other Greek word is the word rhema. And that word rhema in Ephesians 6, where it's talking about the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, it's talking about a, it's talking about a rhema word of God, a specific word of God. And so rhema means spoken word or speech, spoken word or speech. And here's what this looks like. It's when Holy Spirit takes a piece of scripture or a scripture, something Jesus said, and then reveals it just to you and speaks to your heart and your life and your situation through that scripture. That is a rhema word from God. Let me give you an example. You might be reading John 3.16. That's a pretty good one, right? Like if you've been to VBS before, which by the way, ours is coming up this week. You better register all you procrastinators. Um, You read John 3.16, popular scripture, for God so loves the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should believe in him shall have everlasting life. But if you read that and God's got a rhema for you, you might read, and God so loved the world. Wait a second. I live in this world. That means God loves me. God, I needed to know that you love me. Right? How about Philippians 4.19? For my God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. And you're reading that and you have have more month than you do money. And you're stressing and you come across that and it's a rhema word. God, you, you promised that you would meet my needs? Now, you might not meet all my wants, but you promised to meet my needs. That's for me. I can, I can hang my hat on that scripture, and I can believe you, and I can trust you. Thank you, God. That's what a rhema word looks like. Point number two, God will speak through confirmation, Mark 16 and 20. Mark 16 and 20, it says, Then the disciples went out and preached everywhere, and the Lord worked with them and confirmed his word with signs accompanying it. So God uses confirmation to speak. God said, this is my promise, this is my word, and I'm going to show you that it, that it is true by confirming it. In this instance, it was with signs and wonders through the hands of the disciples, but God wants to speak to you through confirmation. If you're hearing something and you want to know, you're like, is that God or did I just binge too much on Netflix? Like, Lord, is this you or not? Then just ask him, God, would you confirm what I'm hearing so that I know that it's you? Now, the truth is not everything is a sign. Just because you have an experience doesn't mean that it is a sign from God, but don't discount it because it might be. And ask God for discernment. Ask God for clarity. Gideon in the Bible, he wanted to know if God was really calling him to lead Israel into battle. I don't know about you, but sometimes I read the stories and I put myself in their position and I'm like, I don't know, if a steak dinner spontaneously combusted by fire, I might be pretty positive that, that God is saying, do what I told you to do. And yet God in his graciousness gives Gideon four confirmations all the way up to the battle with Midian. God was good enough to be gracious with him. Does my circumstance, does what somebody else is saying to me, is what I'm seeing does it align with what I'm already hearing, right? I'm not saying God can't give you something out of left field, but a lot of times what will happen with confirmation is God is already whispering to you and you're wondering about it. Then he'll come along and he'll confirm it. He'll show you my stamp of approval. This is what you need to do. This is where you need to go. This is the decision you need to make, right? Point number three, dreams and visions. Dreams and visions. So, Dreams and visions, 
I, I think it's interesting because when you read the Bible, there are so many examples of dreams and visions in the Bible. But now we're in 2023, and all of a sudden we don't really believe in dreams and visions anymore. And I, th- I just think that's ironic that something that's in Scripture so many times we would discount. Let me give you a Scripture to put on it, which is Acts chapter 2 and verse 17. And it says this, in the last days. How many of you know, probably in the last days, like famines, wars and rumors of wars, I'm thinking that, you know, if nothing else, it aligns with Scripture. So in the last days, here's the promise for in the last days. God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Prophecy is actually one example of how God speaks. Your young men will see visions. They'll be visionary. Your old men will dream dreams. Now, I'm not saying that every weird, cockamamie, crazy dream that you've ever had has spiritual significance. Bro, if if you watch CSI before bed, you're going to have weird dreams. I'm just telling you right now. But God can be in those dreams. Think about Jesus' birth. Joseph has two dreams. One is a warning dream. You need to go to Egypt. You need to get out of here. Another is a dream that, hey, guess what? Uh, uh, Mary really did conceive by the Holy Spirit. So these are significant dreams that he's having that affect Jesus' life from the very beginning. The Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 16, he's headed one direction and he has a dream of a man from Macedonia. And he literally changes on a dime the direction that he's going to go because of a dream that had prophetic implications. Now, I don't know, I just, I don't just know this from scripture. I've literally seen this happen in my own life. And uh, you might be like, well, this doesn't align with my theology. Well, I've got the experience, so I'm going to tell the story. Um, in, it was around 2014 to 2015. I can't remember the exact date when this happened. But um, we had somebody who went to our church in Oklahoma, and she would actually uh, babysit our kids sometimes, and she really loved Kate, and she was an extreme introvert, but super sweet, super sweet. And one day she came up to us after church, and she's like, hey, I had this dream, and this happened, and this happened, and I heard this phrase. And we're like, oh, that's interesting. So we could just kind of, you know, put it on the back burner of the stove and just let it simmer. Well, that was... 2014, 2015, 2016, what she dreamed came to pass in exact detail, and the words that were spoken were verbatim, not like kind of maybe could be. No, I'm talking a verbatim sentence of exactly what was said. Here's the thing. You can't make this stuff up. You you can't pretend, well, that's just a coincidence. No, God shows us all the way through his scripture. Why would God show us in scripture and then quit doing it now? (laughs) Point number four is prayer. Prayer. Prayer is one of the most common ways that the king communicates with his kids. So I want to give you an acronym to help you with prayer because like you can't even, you can even preach a full s- series on the amount, like you would have to extend the series, like 25 weeks, 26 weeks, 32 weeks, just to cover all the ways that we can pray to God. But I want to give you um, just a simple acronym to help you remember when you pray. So the acronym is the word ACTS, ACTS, not like the body spray or the deodorant, like A-C-T-S, ACTS. The A stands for adoration. Adoration is giving God praise and honor and worship and exaltation and glory just for who he is. Fully realizing that the, the breath that, are, that is in my lungs is a byproduct of your goodness and your faithfulness. And I know that in the next moment it might not be there. So uh, God, I give you praise for who you are. I give you adoration for who you are. The C is confession. Even part of the model prayer that Jesus taught his disciples 
it literally talks about forgive me my sins, forgive me my debts, right? So we see confession. Third is thanksgiving, thanking God for what he's done, past tense, and what he's going to do, future tense. Like, thank him for what's coming. God, I thank you that you're good. I thank you that you're the Alpha and the Omega. That means you know the end from the beginning and the beginning from the end, God. You know it all. And I thank you, God, that you are already ahead of me in my life and you're making a way for me. That's, that's thanksgiving into the future. But thanking him for what he's done. Thank you, God, that you brought me a long way. Thank you for your grace that's ridiculous and faithful. Thanksgiving. And then finally, when you've done the first three, now you can qualify for supplication. The problem is we try to do it backwards and bring God our grocery list of wants, needs, and desires, and we start out with supplication. No, don't start out with supplication. Start out with adoration. And then you finally move to supplication. A great example is Philippians 4, 6, where it says, make your requests known. Supplication is a prayer of supply. You're, you're praying for supply for yourself, but also, and even more so, for others. Is your prayer life only about you? Gimme, gimme, gimme. God, I need, I need, I need. Or are you praying for others? Because the Bible says that Job had his breakthrough when he pr prayed for his ridiculous, <laughs> bad advice, no good friends. Like they didn't deserve Job's prayer, and he prayed for him anyways. And the byproduct of that was a breakthrough in his life, the supply that he needed. Point number five is fasting. Here's what fasting does. It silences our flesh, but it feeds our spirit. It, it, it tells our flesh to shut up, and it refocuses our direction on God. See, the prophets and the patriarchs, they fasted. Peter fasted, Paul fasted, Jesus fasted, so why don't we fast? Mm, let's just slide along after that one. Got quiet up in here. See, fasting is not just self-denial or self, some form of self-punishment. It's connected to prayer. You're not just not eating food. It's not just that. We're abstaining from something that we do want because we're saying and making a statement, God, I want you more. So God, I'm focusing on you above this number seven value meal. You didn't need it anyways. You didn't, your cholesterol level didn't need that anyways. And fasting is often connected to spiritual and circumstantial breakthrough in your life. So fasting is something that we do here at Love of Christ Church. In fact, we take the 21-day gap in the month of January to start off the year by putting focus on God first. Why do we do that? Well, there's multiple reasons. If we're really trying to put our flesh into uh, submission, <laughs> that's the perfect time because in Thanksgiving through December, think about it. You've been eating so many carbs, you've gotten a little fluffy, and you're out of routine. Self-control is out the window. Yeah, what's, what's one more of that, those kitchen sink cookies? I, I don't mind if I do. So it's getting your spirit in alignment. And once your spirit is in alignment, it's crazy how well you hear the whisper of God in your life. So I'm telling you from experience what God does through those times. Now, just because you fast, that doesn't mean you have to go 21 days without any food. Like, you could just go Daniel fast and do 21 days of like vegetables and nuts. Now, some of you are like, that sounds like hell, Pastor. Uh, I'd rather go without all food. <laughs> Your diet doesn't have a lot of green in it. I, I, I get it. The point is, is that God will speak to us clearly when we're fasting because it prioritizes him first. Point number six, fleeting thoughts. Let me explain this one. 
Remember that God shows us in Elijah's story that he speaks in a still small voice. He speaks in a whisper. And what I've learned in my life is there are times when like I'm just, I'm just mowing the lawn, I'm just taking a shower, I'm just writing a message, and then all of a sudden I see somebody's face flash just in my mind's eye. What I've learned is that when that happens, it's usually God's way of saying, hey, I need you to pray for them or I need you to send a text over them right now. And I've, I've learned, because I have missed it, I've learned over time, just drop what you're doing and shoot that text. Can I tell you, the people that I've reached out to and just said, hey, I don't know what's going on, but I had you on my heart. Like, I'm telling you the response is, Pastor, you have no idea the timing of what you said right there. I'm telling you, somebody needs to know God's speaking to you and speaking through you So share that, don't keep it. And sometimes, I mean, it can be something, I'm not talking like you have this open-eye vision like Peter did with Cornelius. Like if that happens, cool. Like, that's pretty dope. But for me, most of the time, it's a nanosecond flash in my mind. And I've just learned over time and over repetition, listen to that, it might be God. Now, not, as we know, not every thought is a God thought. Some thoughts we need to take captive to the obedience of Christ. Point number seven, an unction. Let me explain this one. We're going to go in. The, we're going to go to the King James for this one. Okay, we're going to go rock it old school. First John two and twenty says, "But you," it's talking to all of us. It says, "You right? But you have an unction from the Holy One, and you know all things." Another translation says you have an anointing from the Holy One or an anointing from the Holy Spirit. What it's talking about is we can have this anointing or this unction and connected to that unction or that knowing is knowledge, is truth, is direction. There is a knowing that comes as a byproduct of that unction from Holy Spirit. And, and this can be like a knowing on the inside that's deriving from Holy Spirit. So let me say it like this. It could just be something in your gut. You ever just had something in your gut and you couldn't shake it? And you found out later, I'm sure glad I listened to that gut instinct. Like, that's not your sixth sense. That, that's Holy Spirit at work. He's giving you an unction. He's giving you a knowing. You just, I don't know why. I just know that I know that I know. I remember one time I was praying and I had really been seeking, seeking God. Uh, we, were, I, we were young, didn't make a lot of money and made lots of financial mistakes. And uh, we, had, we had a good amount of debt in our lives. But I remember praying one time and God, God told me, he said, by the end of the year, you're going to be debt-free. By the end of the year, you're going to be debt-free. And I was like, all right, Lord. And, and then I thought about it, and I was like, that's crazy. How's that going to happen? Like, I'm looking at the math. I'm like, one plus one doesn't equal two here, okay? But I couldn't shake it in here. And literally, in God fashion, on December 31st, Somebody walked up to us and said, I need you to write you a check for your debt. How much is it? And it was paid off. But I couldn't shake it in here. That's what an unction feels like. I I can't get away from it. I can't shake it. I'm not saying be led by all the feels, right? But I am saying as you continue to pray, if it stays, it could be God speaking to you. Point number eight is circumstances. God speaks through circumstances, but not all circumstances are God speaking, and you have to learn to discern the difference. Let me give you an example. 1 Kings 17, the circumstance is drought. Drought caused Elijah to go to Zarephath. Again, in Genesis 26, you have Isaac, and he's in a land of famine because of drought, and he's wanting to run off to Egypt And God says, stay where you are in the land of the Philistines. And he was blessed abundantly. What's the point? In both of these situations, 
circumstances spoke. It was the same circumstance, however, it was different directives. The circumstance in your life might not be speaking to the circumstance in somebody else's life. And not all circumstances have spiritual implications, but some do. So pray about it and say, God, are you talking to me through this? Don't be that person who's like, flat tire, spiritual warfare. Barista with an attitude, just give me my coffee, spiritual warfare. Poor parking place at Walmart, no, that's on you. That's, that, you know that that place is always full and, and you know you're gonna park on the back 40 because you decided to sleep in on a Saturday and you showed up at noon with everybody else. And you resisted the Walmart pickup. That's not spiritual warfare. That's common sense. The devil is a liar. Yes, he is. But sometimes it's just life. So discern the difference. Point number nine is peace. Pastor, how is peace going to speak? I'm glad you asked. Open your Bibles to Colossians chapter 3 and verse 15. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 15, and it says this, and let the peace that comes from Christ rule. I want you to write that word rule down. I want you to highlight it, copy paste it, post it, whatever you need to do. The peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. For as members of one body, you are called to live in peace and always be thankful. That word rule right there, It means to decide, to determine, and to direct. Do you realize if there's peace to do something, then that's guidance. If there's a lack of peace and a whole bunch of anxiety, it might not be God telling you to do that thing. In fact, the word picture right there for that word, that English word rule, is it's an umpire. Well, what does an umpire do? Ball or strike? inbounds or out of bounds. That's a foul, that's a technical. In other words, you'll let the peace of God show you whether you should do it, not do it. You're letting the peace of God lead you. If the peace is there, even if the circumstance is crazy, God, I trust you. (laughs) Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil. You'll, You'll be led by the peace or the lack thereof. Or it can be like, this is a no-brainer. I should, be, I should be doing this, but there is an absolute lack of peace. Pump the brakes. Pump the brakes. You need to pray on that a little bit longer. All right. Ten. God speaks through others. God speaks through others. From cover to cover in the Bible, There are so many examples of God speaking through people. Speaking from this person to get a message to that person. We see it with prophets speaking to kings. We see it with fathers pronouncing blessings over their children. We see it all throughout. We see it with believers sharing what they're hearing from Holy Spirit. Remember, Philip had some daughters, and Paul is on his way to Jerusalem, and they they basically tell Paul, if you go to Jerusalem, like, you're gonna gonna suffer there. Now, Paul had an assignment, and he went anyways. But do you see the fact that one person had something to say to another person, and God was in it, and it was accurate? In fact, Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 13 says, exhort one another daily. In other words, somebody else needs what you have. They need the the positivity you have. They need the word that you have. You're praying and God drops something on you. You're driving on the interstate and God drops something on you for somebody else. Now, don't let weird Christians ruin this for you. Like, maybe you have heard this term, maybe you haven't. But like parking lot profit, mm, that's, that's sus. I'm just saying, I'm just saying. So just because you have somebody say something doesn't always mean that it's God. And the truth is, because people are broken, we're gonna miss it. Lord knows I've missed it yay many times. 
Like, I've missed it so many times, but God is gracious with us. And if somebody, I say it like this, if somebody has manipulated you, here's what I mean by that. If they said, well, the Lord's telling me this about you, but they're really doing it because they're insecure or they're really doing it because they're trying to control you, I am so sorry that they perverted the name of the Lord with their manipulation. But that doesn't mean that we throw the baby out with the bathwater. On my desktop is a voice memo. I actually listened to it this morning. And it's dated 10-1-21. And let me tell you the backstory behind it. Because it was a word that somebody shared with me. And I actually have the recording of it. And so I was at breakfast with many of you know Pastor Frankie. He's one of the overseers here at Love of Christ Church. And, and uh, we were at a good old southern Cracker Barrel. Bless God. Carbs and heart-clogging food. And, and I knew he was about an hour away from my house speaking at this conference. And so I was like, I just had this thing kind of in my gut. And uh, after we left breakfast, I just called him up. And I was like, hey, Pastor Frankie, can I go with you tonight? He's like, yeah, come on, come with me. And so I went, and uh, I was there, and we were just worshiping and, and heard a great word. And, and then afterwards, there was just some ministry going on, and, you know, they, the worship team was still up there. They were playing, and we were just all worshiping. And the, the pastor pointed at me, and he said, come up here. And I turned, and I was like, hey, bro, he's talking to you. Get up there. And then he was like, no, you. Me? Are you sure? I, not this guy. Anyways, I walked up, and this man who didn't know me, I had literally shaken his hand, and he didn't remember my name. Like five minutes before service, he shook my hand. Didn't know who I was. But the things that he said were things that only God knew. In fact, there, there were some things when I re-listened this morning there were some things that just started taking place in the last three months. And when I did the math, remember I said that was on 10-1-21? Part of the fulfillment of what he said was the Pearsons getting to Delaware. And 360 days after that God encounter, we had our ordination service. You can't tell me that God is a God who doesn't still speak. You're his kids, and he wants to have conversation and relationship with you. We just need to learn how to hear. Let's pray, church. Heavenly Father, I just pray right now over every person in this room, every person listening, everyone in Middletown. God, I pray a special prayer, and my prayer is this, that you would open up spiritual ears. God, I pray that you would give people what Jesus called ears to hear, spiritual ears that could hear his voice. God, I pray right now that you would help us to hear the frequency of, of heaven. God, that we would hear your whisper, that we would see you in circumstances, that we could see you divinely directing and guiding and orchestrating areas in our lives. God, let us be like Samuel and say, speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. Open up our ears to hear. In Jesus' name, we pray. And the church said, amen, amen. Middletown, we love you. I'm going to pass it off to Pastor Tony, but you guys are in our hearts, and we're so thankful for you.